Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the next edition of our Museum from Home uh, Benjamin Franklin House Lecture Series. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, my name is Caitlin, and I'm the Operations Manager. Um, and Benjamin Franklin House, we're the only surviving Benjamin Franklin home in the entire world, uh, if you can believe that. Uh, Benjamin Franklin lived here for 16 years uh, before the American Revolution. Um, and uh, we are a, a small charity that runs this historic house. And unfortunately, we, we've been closed um, due to the COVID-19 epidemic, but we um, have been, um, uh, we've reopened recently over the weekend, so if anybody is London-based, um, I would um, encourage you to come visit us. Uh, you can see all the information on our website, www.benjaminfranklinhouse.org. Um, and today, I am very thrilled to introduce Perry Gossi, who is tutor in modern history at Lincoln College, Oxford, and he will be speaking on the rise of the private banker in Franklin's London. So, over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Caitlin, and, and thank you all for, for coming, uh, so to speak. Um, well, I'm just going to put up a, a, a PowerPoint, so uh, just bear, bear with me. Um, okay. And, right. Hopefully you all can see that. Um, well, again, it's a great pleasure uh, to actually to be here again. Uh, I, I, I spoke uh, Franklin House uh, last year. And uh, when I came last time, I, I talked about Blackfriars Bridge, uh, sort of nearby, and its development in mid 18th century London. And today, um, I'm instead of starting with a, a, a very big bridge, uh, I'm starting uh, with a very intimate uh, object, um, uh, which is Benjamin Franklin's. Uh, uh, pocketbook or, or wallet, um, and I'm going to use it, you know, as a springboard uh, to talk about a much wider uh, set of developments, which is the rise of the private banker uh, in Franklin's London. Uh, now, to me, this, this pocketbook uh, symbolises an important shift in the way in which uh, property Britons organise themselves uh, and their finances uh, in the mid-18th century as we see uh, the proliferation of uh, specialised banking services across the country. Um, London's a key part of this, uh, and in fact, there had been, uh, you know, sort of, uh, as, as we'll see, private bankers uh, since the late 17th century. Um, but uh, you know, the, the mid-18th century, Franklin's time in London is a key uh, time for the development of this profession. Now, there are very, very many stories that can be told uh, about the development of banking, private banking at this time. But in today's uh, short talk, I want to explore how the rise of the private banker uh, represented an, an important accommodation uh, between the landed and commercial elites of Georgian Britain. And I want to give you uh, a set of images to start you thinking about um, uh, the significance of the rise of the banking profession. And here are six, or the first of your six bankers. Um, I've been looking at a lot of different bankers, uh, you know, pro probably in excess of 300 uh, in, in uh, recent years. Um, uh, but here we have uh, six leading bankers. And what you'll see is that they're portraying themselves uh, in, in very different ways. Uh, the top line of Coots, Rogers, and, and Hammersley, uh, you know, present themselves as the sober men of commerce, of business. Um, you can trust these guys. Um, uh, the bottom line uh, of Charles Hall and Sir Richard Carl Glynn um, are presenting themselves in a more genteel fashion. Uh, now I'm not saying that that means they're you know, aristocratic playthings. No, um, uh, they are uh, communicating uh, their you know, some very different ideas of uh, you know, their, their elite status within society. Um, but all of these guys are bankers. Um, and uh, that's what has you know, led my uh, interest uh, towards them. And today, uh, I am going to be examining the ways in which uh, uh, both the practices and images of, of bankers develop, uh, especially uh, in London. Because it is in the very neighbourhood of Craven Street itself um, uh, that we see uh, the, the growth of private banks, uh, which symbolise the, you know, the, the meeting of uh, powerful forces of uh, both commerce and land. Um, 
And I hope to show how bankers help to bridge existing social divides in both their professional and in their private capacity. Um, crucially, the bankers did not simply adopt the, the manners and material culture of the upper orders, perhaps in the way that the bottom line of these uh, images is suggesting. Um, uh, they're not simply trying to emulate um, uh, the aristocratic orders. Um, but what they're trying to do in, in both work and at play is they're seeking to communicate uh, important commercial values and to build trust as part of their business plans. And Franklin was but one of many thousands who directly benefited from these key developments. Okay. So uh, how am I going to do this? Well, uh, uh, simply three sections. One, I'm going to start with an overview of the, the rise of the banking uh, profession, uh, looking in particular at geographies and technologies of, of banking. Uh, then I, I'm going to uh, move on to look at the ways in which uh, uh, commercial business values uh, were communicated at work. Uh, and uh, I'll finish up briefly probably talking about uh, how bankers communicated these values at work and at play. Okay, so first of all, let's get a sense of the, the rise of the profession. And uh, this is the only uh, uh, table of data that I'm going to show you. So all the rest will just be images. Um, but I think it does a, a very good job uh, of communicating straight away uh, of the growth in the number of private banks. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in the late 17th century, we do actually see a uh, proliferation of, of what are often called goldsmith bankers, um, uh, who provide uh, what they call running caches um, uh, for their clients. Um, now this happens at both ends of, of London, uh, so both the commercial city um, uh, and also the, the more uh, leisurely sort of West End, if you like. Um, and uh, what we see as we come into the 18th century uh, is that the, the number of these gold bankers are, are up to, uh, there's about 20 or so banks. Um, now, by the time Franklin comes you know, to London in the 50s, uh, you know, the number has grown slightly. But uh, by the time he leaves, um, it's almost doubled. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll travel uh, by uh, the early 19th century. Uh, and if you look at the other uh, columns, you're, you'll see that uh, Lombard Street, the famous uh, home of uh, banking, if you like, um, uh, right through the period, um, is uh, a, you know, a very significant center uh, for private banking, uh, often uh, so providing um, for commercial uh, businesses and individuals. Um, but we see a, a very significant rise um, in uh, the West End of town, in Westminster. Uh, I mean, Fleet Street is technically in the city, but it's often seen um, as a, a West End area. Um, a liminal space um, uh, between uh, uh, the City of London and Westminster. Um, uh, what we see there is a very significant rise. And this is often uh, linked to the influx of uh, landed gents, um, uh, i.e. gents and aristocrats, uh, who are coming into London more frequently for a more perpetually sitting parliament or, or for leisure uh, all the London season. Okay, so we actually, as I say, we're seeing this sort of growth. Um, uh, and I just want to show you where this is happening. Oh, I'll just give a, a, li a little uh, list. This is uh, London Directory uh, of 1763, um, which is no longer identifying goldsmiths running caches. They're actually now, um, uh, say by the 1760s, actually listing bankers. Yeah, and we have about 30 or so here. As you can see, multiple partnerships the um, uh, maximum number of partners is six um, by law by this stage, uh, and they are spread uh, and as I said, uh, uh, a real concentration around Lombard Street still, um, but stretching into the West End. And uh, the, the next image um, from uh, a, a very good article by uh, uh, a scholar called uh, Ian Black um, represents uh, 
the where you would find banks in the vicinity of um, Craven Street. Uh, and here uh, you can see the, uh, the, the major east-west axis of, of the Strand, Fleet Street, has um, uh, already become a home um, for banks by the 1740s. Um, uh, uh, don't want to say much more about it other than the fact that you know, this reflects you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, a major uh, axis of business uh, and, and travel uh, for Londoners and the banks uh, realise they need to be um, on the major for thoroughfares uh, if they are going to provide accessible facilities for, for their customers. Um, so this is in the 1740s. Um, by uh, um, 1801, um, we are seeing uh, a significant extension. We still have the banks, uh, you know, sort of uh, lining the Strand and Fleet Street down towards Charing Cross. Um, famous names like you know, Charles and Drummonds and Halls, you know, sort of you know, in that uh, sort of area. But we see further expansion uh, into, uh, if, you, if you like, the polite areas of St. James's Square and up uh, towards Oxford Street to, to, to New Bromley Street, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, so um, in, in Franklin's you know, say, uh, lifetime uh, in London, we are seeing major changes uh, in the neighbourhood. Now, um, that's the geography. What about the technology? What are these banks providing um, for, for their customers? Now, uh, there are some very specialised services, which we might talk about in, in, in um, uh, discussion. Um, but today, I'd just be stressing um, the bread and butter, uh, if you like, deposit current account type customer um, uh, that certainly I am to my bank <laughs> to, to this day. Um, and uh, Certainly, as I say, what we'll see in the next few slides is becoming a commonplace for propertied Britons uh, by the late 18th century. Um, now, the opening uh, uh, slide you know, showed Franklin's uh, own wallet. Uh, this one uh, is an example uh, from a slightly later period, but actually shows it open. And here we see uh, it, it has both a combination of passbook and, and wallet. There, there you, you can see slightly on the right hand side, you can actually see the pages uh, closed of um, uh, the, the passbook, if you like, where they will enter. I'll show you an example in a second, uh, where they would enter their, their credits and debits to their account. Uh, but what I like about this uh, image in particular is it shows a wonderful little compartment you know, in this wallet, which has kept these, I was stunned when I opened this in the, in the, the archive in, the, um, in London, uh, it has kept these checks pristine, clean and dry um, uh, to this day. Um, so um, we will, uh, it's easy to imagine uh, that this type of item uh, in, inside the great coat or, or of a gentleman wandering around London. Um, now, uh, this is what you also might find in their pockets. Um, this is a, a bank book of, um, uh, of a Welsh family in, in, in um, uh, South Wales um, who actually bank with a London bank um, because uh, they, they are going regularly uh, to London uh, for, for the season um, and uh, they keep this bank book. And if we open it up, we can see credits and debits on, on both sides. Okay, so they are providing, you know, they started to provide um, uh, facilities that, you know, we, we are more uh, uh, blessed with electronic uh, communication these days, but we are seeing, you know, the development of basic banking services for uh, a very much wider banking public. I mean, it's very hard to get the figures uh, because we don't have all, all the records that survive, but I would think in the late 17th century, there might have been five, 10,000 people who were keeping accounts um, with, with London banks um, by uh, the late 18th century. I think that figure would be more like 80, 90 to 100,000. Uh, okay, so even though the number of the banks is increasing threefold, um, their, their client lists are, are um, rising much more quickly than that. And when Franklin comes to uh, secure, um, uh, or uh, when he wants to open a bank account, 
Uh, he does with the Bank of Smith, Wright and Gray of Lombard Street. Um, so actually in the city of London. Um, so he doesn't actually open an account with the bank closest to him, um, but uh, he does open his accounts with uh, a Quaker bank. Now, if his links to Pennsylvania might well you know, have, have something to, to, to do with that. What is clear is that it, it's a very um, happy um, uh, uh, relationship over many years. He, he probably opens accounts 1764 around there um, and retains the accounts, you know, even after um, uh, the bad business in the American War. Um, and I was saying to Caitlin earlier on, uh, in fact, the, this London bank is one of probably the only um, uh, British or one of the very few British uh, names that actually uh, is in Franklin's will. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I show you this, sort of, uh, this is a Quaker meeting um, from the uh, uh, city of London meeting in, in the uh, 1770s. Uh, the head of the firm, Thomas uh, Smith, uh, is said um, to be uh, seated facing forward to us um, in the front row closest to the ladies. So he's right in the center aisle. Um, uh, and uh, it's said clearly, um, he, his bank, which had been established uh, as early as the 1730s, uh, is providing Franklin with services right into the later 1780s. Um, in fact, uh, Franklin had a very close relationship um, with John Wright, who's the sort of middle partner of, of, of the bank. Um, uh, and they, again, they, they write, they, they share uh, great interests in science. Um, uh, and, and indeed in, in, in their politics. Um, and uh, clearly uh, there, there is a close relationship uh, between uh, the two men. Uh, and he continues uh, to, to stay with the bank and say right through uh, to his death. Um, now, um, it is that ability to sustain trust uh, over time and space, uh, which makes the, the banker so interesting for me. Um, and uh, at one level, they are providing um, punctual um, and efficient financial services. Um, but I think it's the broader uh, values that are espoused by the bankers, which have a much wider resonance for uh, our understanding of the development of British society at this time. Um, and that's why I want us to look at the values that these banks are broadcasting uh, uh, through a myriad of, of ways. So let's look at some um, business values. And where I'm going to start is actually looking at business premises. Okay, so the banks, the physical banks themselves. Now, the point I would um, broadly say about uh, sort of the banks is that they are trying uh, a, 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 in, in essence, um, uh, to communicate um, key values that make bankers, um, uh, if you like, a, a sure bet um, for the deposit of their uh, of, of clients' money. Um, now, there are some obvious things. They, they're looking for security, of course, um, uh, but they're also looking for solid judgment. They're looking for discretion. They're, they're looking for actually application in industry in the, in, in the client's interest. Um, they're looking for consistency. Um, and they're looking perhaps beyond all for, for permanence. Um, and all of this, quite rightly, uh, and we do this to this day, is, all of this is required by the custodians of other people's money. Uh, it's, it's, there's a, you know, clients have a right to expect this. Um, but bankers have to communicate these values uh, in various ways, or, or else they're going to lose custom. Uh, just as a backdrop to this, I'd say the, you know, the late 17th, early 18th century had been a, quite an un unpredictable time for banks. A lot had gone bust through for various reasons. Um, uh, but what we see from the mid 18th century onwards is that banks are more consistently um, you know, surviving the perils of their trade and actually garnering more customers. And looking at the banking premises helps us understand how they did that. Now, there are various ways in which you, you can communicate those values. Um, I, mean, I present two here for your uh, election. Um, what we see on, uh, first of all, on the, the left-hand side 
is Charles Blank uh, at One Fleet Street by, by Temple Bar. Um, and what you're seeing there is, is a typical, uh, if you like, post-fire year sort of hats. Um, uh, and notice how, how cramped it actually is. Um, it's it, it's a, a tall, thin property. Um, but is, this is a, a, a premise, a set of premises which the bank retains through to um, the, the later 19th century. Um, they don't change it. We'll go inside later on. But what they're doing by not changing it, you know, is actually communicating a reassuring message of uh, permanence and consistency. Um, if we look at the other image, uh, this is Askills Bank uh, in Lombard Street, which was built in the 1750s um, by Robert Taylor. And as you can see, it's a much more, what well, you might say, almost fashionable sort of classical you know, sort of image. But notice that it is, uh, it is very restrained you know, in the same way uh, as it might be aspiring to a, um, a genteel air. Uh, what we're seeing uh, on the ground floor level, you know, is these heavy rustications um, and, and firm columns, which actually is giving a solidity um, to the whole structure. Uh, and then the rest of the, you know, once you, you move beyond you know, sort of the ground level, you're actually seeing uh, a symmetrical, uniform, uh, but sparsely adorned um, uh, facade. Uh, and this actually, again, communicates uh, that, you know, these aren't giddy-headed people who are throwing money away. Uh, yeah, sort of on their architecture. They are communicating solidity uh, and, and trust us with the, your futures. Okay, so there are different ways in which you can communicate um, the essential values of your business. Uh, and what we see is that by the late 18th, early 19th century, um, uh, architectural uh, designs of, of banks have settled down to a significant extent. And in fact, I give you uh, a couple of uh, examples from the City of London. Uh, and you can see again, you know, so that, that shop floor level, the ground floor level does have some, you know, ornament, you know, uh, and it's enticing people in. Um, but, uh, you know, so the upstairs, you know, are uh, uh, symmetrical, you know, unfussy, uh, and again, you know, communicating solidity. Um, I mean, notice too, of course, the, there's, there's a lot of glass, um, which of course is, is vital for, uh, you know, the sort of work the banks are doing as the clerks pour over their ledgers um, and, and welcome uh, as of their clients uh, in the ground floor level. Um, a pause on, on Hall's Bank um, here, um, uh, which this is the rebuilding the bank in 1829. Uh, um, uh, uh, the bank uh, had grown and had grown its uh, premises, which it had had since the late 17th century. Um, and what's so interesting with this bank, again, you can see, you know, the sort of your know, design features we've already mentioned, um, you know, so there. I mean, this is you know towards the western end of, you know, of town. It has they have a lot of elite clients there, um, but they again have gone for uh, they, they resisted the temptation uh, for something grander, uh, and in fact the the architect did propose you know, a uh, a portico for the entrance to mark the entrance in a Greek temple portico, but this was rejected by by um, the banking partners uh, on the grounds that this was and I quote too magnificent for uh, a house of commons. Um, uh, and in fact, you know, we, we end up with the bank, which stands, uh, you know, it's still there. Um, you, you can, you know, so, gosh, after the talk, we could have said, if we were all together, we could have said, oh, we can go and have a, go and have a look at it. We can't, sorry about that. But, um, uh, but what we do have, you know, is, is a, a reminder, you know, that uh, the 1820s of the restrained, um, you know, investment uh, that banks are putting you know, sort of in, to their premises, um, and just as a way of by way of contrast, um, uh, I, I show you uh, the first premises of the Rothschild Merchant Bank. Okay, not so much a private bank, but a merchant bank in the early nineteenth century, uh, which is New Court, which is very much a, uh, in, in in the commercial heart of the city, um, and this actually is a, a traditional courtyard house. Um, uh, because the, you know, the Rothschilds are not you know, sort of dealing um, with you know, current account customers, you know, so to speak. 
Um, they, they are you know, all about the finance of your know, big business, the inter international business um, as well as other services. So they don't need a, a, uh, a street front you know, premise. So they have one of these sort of classic um, city courtyard houses, which are off um, you know, the main thoroughfares. Um, I mean, it's regular, you know, it's, it's a big building, uh, but it won't have the same services uh, as these other private banks uh, will be supplying. So we bond, that's the outside. What about the insides? Um, well, um, uh, we're going to start by uh, having a look at one of the most interesting banks for, for, for me, which uh, is the Middleton Bank of 1739 to 40, uh, which is the forerunner of Coots Bank, uh, of course, which still continues to, to this day. Um, and uh, the exterior, not much to say about it. You're already getting a sense of the rhythm. I mean, this is one of the very early, you know, sort of um, specific banking houses. I mean, Middleton, Middleton had started, you know, sort of, um, uh, in, in Goldsmith, but uh, this marks uh, a time where he's really committed towards um, his uh, banking full time, if you like, um, for customers. Uh, and it tells us a lot, you know, we unfortunately don't have images on the the inside. But this is part of a set of documents that show the, the sort of specifications which uh, you know, hint at uh, you know, a more custom focus, a customer focused um, you know, provision of services. Um, uh, for, for instance, on the, on the first floor of this bank, which is denoted by the little pediment, you know, sort of uh, first floor level, uh, there is a great room which was 500 square feet, um, 13 feet high, um, uh, which was to be decorated in a, in a, uh, a quaint, you know, luxurious way. Um, uh, in fact, there's, there was a, uh, a privy there that was to have a ma mahogany seat. Um, uh, they were really wanted to make sure that the, the aristocracy and gentry who were coming through this you know, strand bank would actually feel comfortable. Um, so, you know, we, we are seeing bankers think about, you know, carefully about the way that they're, you know, presenting. Uh, and in fact, the, you know, this great room was modelled on, uh, uh, directly modelled on a, a, a quite a fashionable West End address uh, towards Argyle ground for, for the West. Um, so, um, you know, the interiors are just as revealing as the exteriors. And let's go indoors. Uh, and here we'll start with, uh, this is Charles Bank, an image of Charles Bank uh, we mentioned earlier, you know, a, a very staid and un unchanging bank. Uh, and again, you know, what we're seeing here is um, a, a very actually plain um, you know, uh, in in interior. Uh, you've got the banking counter there, uh, somewhere to hold uh, a rail, um, a hat rail to um, uh, hold your clothes uh, if you come in for the wet. Um, I mean, there would have probably been further parlours in, you know, inside where private conversations can take place. Um, but this is a busy, ordered space. Um, and the banks work hard to preserve this. And we know this. You know, we're very lucky that for Childs, uh, a series of cartoons survives from uh, the later 18th century, early 19th century, probably completed by one of the clerks. Um, and they show some of the the day-to-day -day, um, routine of, of these banks. Um, what we see here, uh, and it uh, is you know, sort of the room we just looked at, um, and we see uh, a chap um, at his uh, a clerk at his um, you know, counter, um, uh, and uh, you can just faintly make out um, that there are people angrily, you know, uh, you know, sort of asking for their money, basically. Um, and he's saying, oh, what do you say? Uh, he's pretending not uh, to hear what they're saying. Now, the, the context for this uh, is that this is a run on the bank um, uh, caused by the Bank of England's um, uh, decision in 1797 um, to uh, cease to guarantee um, uh, payments in, in specie, in, in bullion. Um, and this has put the banks you know, in a very difficult situation. So even though the, the banks are trying to uh, make sure that their uh, premises are ordered and uh, reassuringly ordered 
uh, spaces. Um, it's not always easy to achieve. Um, this is on, on a quieter day, you might say, uh, samples of gentility. Um, and what we have here is a, a much less tricky problem for, for the bank, is that a, a lady wearing a, a fashionably large hat can't find her way out uh, of the bank. Uh, and so uh, the vigilant um, staff are escorting her out of the door. Um, and it is that you know, sort of, you know, the, the, the staff are uh, both clerks, um, but also uh, sort of, uh, the doorkeepers and various other more menial staff members are all seen as an important part of portraying the right message. Uh, I'll give you, you know, some of the uniforms that we, we, we know that they wear are, are very smart. This is just a collection cloak, you know, if you like a runner for the bank who's going to be you know, sort of collecting various pieces of paper uh, and, and liaising with the other banks. Um, uh, a, a very uh, sort of smart outfit, uh, and this is the city bank. Um, uh, but you could overdo it, um, and they have always got to be, you know, get the dial right here. Um, they can't, you know, again give the idea of, you know, spending, you know, sort of the the customer's money uh, sort of unnecessarily. And we have here uh, the bank macaroni, you know, um, uh, you know. A, a satire of, of the 1770s, which comes in the wake of, of a very significant um, uh, bank crash uh, you know, the previous year. And, and the hint here is that yes, the banks are un unthinking and, and uh, profligate uh, uh, with the, uh, the customers' deposits. Um, so the, the bankers are all, always under pressure. Um, you know, they are very much in the public sight. Um, and, uh, you know, they do try, or their supporters do try to put across you know, a, a more positive image. You know, we have here um, uh, uh, a pamphlet from 1774, you know, just after the, the, uh, the bank macaroni is trying to put the, uh, the case for the banks. And what we see uh, in the center is, uh, I mean, there's a, a chap who's introducing a long line of uh, interesting folk, which are in, in various um, uh, yes, different costumes, which represents trade from around the world. So this is a merchant introducing this um, to Britannia, who's seated on um, uh, the, the right as we look with her, her capital of liberty. Now, in between the merchant and Britannia actually is a representation of the banking interest, um, which is dropping money on the floor. Um, uh, and representing them as intermediaries, you know, in a successful commercial system. Um, now, much as they might want to do this, <laughs> to put across a positive image, uh, it doesn't always work, or there's always uh, uh, another crash around the corner uh, to cause them uh, difficulties. And what we see here um, is another stop of payment in 1805, um, and we have you know, a, a country uh, gentleman coming in demanding his payment and he's saying I, I'm going to sit here until you pay me basically. Um, uh, I've come a long way. Uh, what we're, I, I, I think it's very interesting about um, this representation other than the, you know, the interior of a bank um, is the again the smart dress you know sort of of um, the, um, uh, the clerks you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, who are working for the bank, um, and also there's a little golden shovel there, notice, yeah, um, uh, for, for uh, handling money. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the sort of image that a lot of crit critiques towards the bank uh, are, are, are making by uh, the, the 1790s. They, they call, you know, the banks empiricist. What they mean by that is that the banks try and, you know, uh, communicate uh, their wealth um, and uh, uh, you know, sort of influence, if you like, um, to a degree that they don't deserve. Um, you know, that they do have these nice premises now and they do have the mahogany desks and, and the gold shovels. Um, but they, you know, this is masking their failure to, to serve the interests of clients. So they're always under pressure in, in these ways. Um, so how, how do the bankers um, you know, respond to this? Well, in the final bit, uh, I will just mention a few, <laughs> Caitlin, I will. Um, uh, uh, 
there are two ways in which bankers really try and uh, uh, communicate their, their, the soundness of their virtues and values to, to their customers. One is by establishing an idea of almost a friendship uh, with, with their customers. Uh, I mentioned Coots here because he is uh, a superb example of someone who over uh, 50 years becomes the uh, confidant of some of the leading figures you know, in the country. He has everybody, Charles James Fox, he has the, the Pitt family, he has uh, 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 the Duchess of Devonshire, you, know, you name it, you know, he, 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 they're on the client list. And he is very solicitous of their interests. And he actually tries to develop true friendships. He takes interest in their families. We could talk much more about this. Um, but he does realize that simply being a professional is not enough. You know, he needs to communicate trust uh, in a more personable way. Um, and you know, he partly does this um, by actually the sobriety of his dress. We're very lucky, in fact, that Coots, his entire wardrobe survives, um, uh, very surprisingly. It's a very, very rare, rare thing to happen. Um, and on the right-hand side, we, we see his day wear. Uh, uh, on the left-hand side, we, we see a slightly jollier you know, uh, sort of off-duty wear, um, which only you know, sort of a very, very small group would, would be allowed to see. Um, and give you another, this is a, a circulation letter uh, announcing um, uh, the retirement of the head of Harry's Bank, one of the West End banks in uh, 1798. Um, and uh, it's in French because they had a lot of foreign business. They developed the first traveler's checks basically um, as part of their business. Uh, and the middle paragraph, um, uh, I'll, I'll translate it for you, simply says, you know, we, and we will you know, not neglect um, to merit and preserve the esteem and confidence of our friends. You know, they are calling uh, the, uh, their, their customers their friends. So partly they, they achieve this, you know, sort of through, um, as I said, close intimate relationships. They also do this by in their broader um, uh, uh, social and cultural strategies. Um, they always show um, uh, a, a due concern for um, the, uh, the the role they're playing um, for uh, both the commercial and landed elites. And I'll give you a few examples here of uh, how, how they uh, establish a sociability which is acceptable um, to the established hierarchy. Uh, this is the, the child mansion in Ostley Park. Um, some of you might have visited it, still stands to this day. And it looks very nice, doesn't it? Indeed, yeah, it almost looks as though, again, they're trying to emulate um, the uh, established elite. Um, well, yes, they are, but this is actually a, a, a nice house, uh, it's true, but it is in a park, it's not in a country estate. You know, it's, it's still very close to London, only about, it's less than 10 miles um, from the bank. Uh, there are lots of features of the bank all over the house. The, the symbol of the marigold, which is the symbol of the bank, is, is in the wallpaper, etc., etc. And in fact, they play much on the fact that this was Sir Thomas Gresham's house, who was one of the great city commercial heroes. So they're not, you know, they've got one foot in, in each camp, if you like. Now, keeping that foot in each camp with their sociability um, and you know, the, the way they spend their leisure time, um, then this, I think, symbolizes, it's a nice way to bring everything together, uh, is the Society for Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturing and Commerce, uh, which was founded in 1754. Um, and um, uh, uh, Franklin would have been hopefully lucky enough to, uh, to see uh, the 1774 uh, building here. Um, and that uh, he should have done, he was a member of, of the Society. And it's here that we actually see uh, more bankers, more bankers by the late 18th century are members of this society than they are of the Goldsmiths Company uh, at the, the beginning of the century, which had been the home of, of bankers and banking services. Um, and it's here, and its commitment to the, the flourishing of the arts, manufacturers and commerce, actually brings these forces of land and commerce together. And in fact, uh, John Wright, um, uh, Franklin's uh, Banker is um, uh, 
awarded a gold medal uh, by the society for planting 64,000 Scots firs in Norfolk uh, in 1767. Uh, and again, it shows the practical uh, and almost patriotic years yes, of interest uh, which the bankers could share with um, uh, many of their clients. Now I'm going to end, I, I, I promise to end here with a little um, uh, exchange, The Man of Business, uh, uh, one of these sort of knockabout comedies uh, from the 1770s, again in the wake of the, uh, the air crash of 1772. And what we actually see here is an exchange between uh, the servant of the, the hero of the comedy, uh, who is, uh, or anti-hero of the comedy, uh, who's called Beverly, who's a young banker, um, who lives in, in, in the West End. And, and fabled, uh, the servant says, well, what is a man of business to do with men of pleasure? Why is a young banker to live with young noblemen? Uh, and one of the other characters here says, why not? Is it not the business of the house carried on at the, the polite end of town on banks, you know, sort of now all over the West End? Does not he live in the very centre of persons of fashion? And he's not, he doesn't have constant dealings with them? No, not shut up in Lombard Street and the city, you know, within the sound of Bow Bell and the sound of the monument, not cramming turtle and venison into the King's Arms or the London Tavern, but balloted into the macaroni and a member of the savoir fee. Of course, this is a satire. But what you actually see, I think, shows very clearly is the fact is that there is still, you know, so the worlds of, the, of, of commerce and, and land in, in the West End are still distinct. Um, but there are groups who are bringing you know, sort of these uh, you know, sort of forces together. And I, I'm suggesting you know, today that the bankers are, are a key part of that. Um, now, I don't want to say the bankers are too important uh, or over important, you know, and there's a lot of criticism towards bankers, you know, which of course continues you know, to, to this day. Um, However, there could be no doubt that sociability could, you know, communicate commercial values of sound judgment, application, and permanence, uh, which could easily translate into the respect of their clients. Uh, the different worlds represented in the pictures I've shown you today could be transcended by amphibians who could understand the social possibilities of a changing economy and society. And there can be no doubt of the importance of Franklin's London to this critical accommodation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Perry. That was really interesting. And I, I thought, I hadn't even thought about how physically the buildings, kind of what it would have looked like, would have kind of affected people's perception. And, and interestingly, you know, Coots Bank with the modern building has an entire glass wall. So um, it's mm. interesting to see the historic connection there. Yeah, no, and, and in fact, if you go beyond the glass wall, if you're lucky enough to get through the door, they do actually have some much older apartments, uh, you know, sort of at the back. Um, and uh, in fact, they have, uh, again, representing, you know, this, this intimate relationship uh, with uh, their clients. One of their clients was um, uh, the first ambassador um, to uh, China. Uh, and so they have a beautiful room, all of oriental wallpaper. You know, and it, again, it represents, you know, just you know, sort of the, the sheer variety, but also, say, the intimacy. Uh, of their relationship with their clients. Well, great. So we have time for questions. So I hope you're you're open to some questions, Perry. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, so we actually have two already that have been asked. So uh, I'll get started with the first one. So um, what would have been the socioeconomic background of private bankers in Franklin's time? What sort of education did they receive? No, it's, it's a really, really good question. Thank you for that. Um, uh, what I would say is that generally, uh, speaking that these bankers are are from commercial backgrounds okay I think that's very important to stress uh, there are by the late 18th century there are one or two sons of gentlemen you know who, who do uh, feature um, but generally speaking you know these bankers are uh, for, for their professional purposes they want to show that they are competent you know in in the uh, you know, handling of, of the finances of um, uh, the families they're dealing with. Um, and they always do want to stress um, that they've got a, a firm commercial education uh, behind them. Uh, I mean, some, um, you know, I, I think, most, as I said earlier, most of the, um, 
by the, the first half of the 18th century, I think most bankers, you are still coming from a goldsmith um, background. Um, in fact, I think half of um, a sample that I've taken from the, in the 1730s, uh, half the banking partners were still members of the goldsmith's company. Um, but by the 1780s, this has dropped to about well, le less than 10%. Um, uh, so that route in, into the profession is, is no longer uh, uh, the common path. Um, uh, most of them actually uh, that I'm seeing in terms of banking partners are uh, from two, two routes. One, they've actually worked within a bank, you know, um, uh, uh, either as you know, sons of bankers uh, you know, and they, they, they've had a, a training up before they take real responsibility. Uh, or they come from a mercantile background. Um, and some of these banks actually are you know, reflective of um, wider uh, commercial connections. So I, I mentioned Quaker banks, it's, you know, uh, you know, the Barclays, who are a very important um, you know, transatlantic mercantile uh, sort of enterprise move into banking uh, by the, uh, the middle of the 18th century. Or they could actually sometimes East India men, you know, um, people who've made their money in the East India Company, uh, John A. Uh, Pybus and Co. Uh, in, in 1780s. So, yes, so I, they need to provide a commercial uh, reassurance to their clients. So that's, and that's reflected in their background. Great. So uh, the next question that we have is, you showed an image of a woman in a bank. Were women generally involved in the banking activities of their household? Uh, did she enjoy the same rights as the man to manage her fa family's financial affairs? That's a very, very good question. Um, uh, I mean, w women do hold accounts in their own name. Uh, I mean, that's, that's quite clear e even by uh, the, the late 17th century. Um, I mean, they, they do form a, a minority. Um, and uh, to have such independence uh, usually meant that they were either spinsters or widows. Um, uh, once married, they would have less control, uh, it does seem, over um, their affairs. Um, but uh, as I said, I mean, we, 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 they are an important element, you know, sort of within um, uh, the, the, the customer lists um, that, that we have. Um, and it is quite clear that um, bankers would, would write directly to women uh, and consult on their financial affairs. Again, to go back to Coots, um, he um, manages um, a, a, a very close and successful correspondence uh, uh, with uh, the Countess of Chatham, who is the widow of uh, what we would think of as Pitt the Elder. Um, and he manages that you know, relationship for over, you know, over 35 years um, until her death. And uh, it's a very close relationship. And he, um, you know, he, he gives her full respect. He is, is always you know, solicitous to, for her financial needs as far as he can be. Um, to the extent, in fact, other members of the Pitt family, including Pitt the Younger, uh, I do sense a, a little bit of jeal jealousy that, you know, from uh, the son you know, uh, to the, the way in which you know, sort of Pitt, is all, uh, Pitt almost feels that you know, Coots is usurping his role <laughs> you know, sort of within the, the family. So again, it's another of those delicate um, boundaries that these bankers you know, sort of have to uh, navigate because they are so, so much at the heart of family affairs. Um, and, in fact, you know, what, what the bankers are often trying to communicate, even though, of course, they, I mean, I have come across one or two female partners, um, but usually they are, they are widows of um, male partners in, in general. Um, but certainly the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the partners are, are trying to communicate uh, a, a, almost a family feel themselves. So they would never neglect um, uh, the, the wider needs of, of a family, whether male or female. And I guess, uh, I think in relation to Benjamin Franklin House, I'm just thinking of somebody like Margaret Stevenson, who was the landlady when Benjamin Franklin lived here. Um, she was a wealthy widow, so I'm assuming that she would have been responsible for her own finances as a widow as well. 
Um, so mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have anything to, to comment about that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, widows could be you know, very, very influential figures, um, you know, and and you know, and and were targeted, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, as as a result. You know, there is, um, you know, very, you know, the London marriage market. Um, or, or often the, the Tunbridge Wells, which is you know, one of the pleasure spots out of London, um, is um, you know, a, a very uh, fertile uh, sort of hunting ground, you know, if you like. But, but it, it is quite clear that women did visit banking premises. You know, they're, not, they're not seen as exclusively sort of male um, uh, spaces. Um, and uh, they, you know, it, it is, it is true that you know if you went to the city of London, um, there there would be many more um, uh, commercial men you know on the books of, of banks. Um, but it is very striking some of the the the, the fuller you know, images that we have from the the early nineteenth century of banks uh, usually show families visiting together. So. Um, uh, uh, obviously, the banks aren't, aren't, aren't fussy in, in many ways in who they take as clients if, if there is a serious estate you know, um, to be managed. But um, uh, more often than not, that's going to be male than, than female. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, and uh, the question is, did the religion of the bankers have much uh, impact attracting customers? I understand many were Quakers. Yes, I mean that that is a, a really interesting question. Um, I think the the short answer is yes. Um, uh, I think there are by the 1760s, uh, 1770s, there are about seven Quaker banks. Um, uh, so they they are a significant presence, um, and it is quite clear that certainly within the bank, you know that that um, is very important for. Um, the the coherence of the partnership and and you do see some other um, uh, religious groups uh, I've come across you know, um, a, a set of congregationalists you know setting up a bank uh, for instance um, so uh, certainly in the setting up of banks where we do see um, you know that that form of association is, is, uh, through religion um, in terms of you know soliciting uh, Clients, you know, this is a really interesting area to, to look at. Um, I think yes, yes. I, I think you know, uh, certainly looking at uh, sort of the the lists of uh, something like a, you know, a Barclays Bank, where we've got you know, some better records. Um, you know, there are a number of you know, Quakers you know, sort of on the list, but by no means is it exclusively Quaker. Um, uh, I think you know, certainly most of these banks you know, want to. You know, encourage as many property people to come through their door as you know, as, as possible. Um, and I don't get a sense of you know them excluding um, uh, members because of their um, uh, religion. In fact, we're, we're very. What comes to mind is there, there's a very good um, set of records for Harry's Bank, which um, uh, I, I mentioned with the. the uh, which had the letter in French to its friends. Um, uh, and they actually do monitor um, uh, new customers and you know, leaving customers and, uh, and why you know, they, they've done, uh, you know, sort of, uh, done so. And, and it's interesting to see that um, they're not so much you know, thinking about uh, religion, um, it's more to do with commercial connections, which of course can have a you know, religious element to that, um, or, or family connections, you know, do, which again can have some sort of religious angle. Um, but it, it, it's religion is not so starred. Um, and in fact, the re for, for reasons of, of leaving banks, um, uh, usually they're, they're going to another bank, um, which you know, they, certainly there isn't a sort of religious continuity that the customer is, is looking for there. Um, and in fact, the, uh, one of my favorite entries is that they actually have an entry for, uh, um, for customers being affronted uh, by the bank, which obviously means they've been turned down for a loan or something like that, which has uh, offended their, their, their sensibilities. Um, so I think religion is important. Um, 
uh, you know, in, in the development of, of banking. Although, uh, again, not many banks um, you know, really want to you know, limit their commercial opportunities by um, uh, being too exclusive. Uh, I mean, other, other reasons you know, for joining a particular bank, I, I think actually provincial um, uh, connections. You know, some of these banks you know, have very strong connections with part, part of the country. I mean, Coots Bank, for instance, you know, in Scotland. Um, uh, um, in Scotland, they have a, you know, that's, that's their origins. Um, and a lot of their early business uh, certainly comes through uh, servicing the financial needs of uh, Scottish nobles coming down, down to London on, you know, for, for business and, and political reasons. Um, uh, but they spread their, their wings very wide, you know, and, and it's by, by the end of the 18th century, even though the, the, the Scots names are still there. Um, uh, some of them Presbyterian, some of them Episcopalian. Um, uh, you know, there's a far wider uh, uh, range of customers too. Thank you very much, uh, Perry, and thank you for the fascinating presentation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you for listening. I was <laughs> sort of out there. This, this is very strange for all of us. <laughs> Indeed. Um, well, uh, just a couple housekeeping notes before we log off. Um, this We have been recording this talk, so if you'd like to watch it again, you can uh, find it on our website. Uh, it'll be uploaded um, tomorrow at the latest. Um, and uh, yes, we are making these talks available for free. Um, so uh, like many historic sites and museums, we've had, we've had to close and we lost a lot of our income. Um, so if you're willing to donate, um, even one pound would be enough. Uh, we'd, be, we'd really much appreciate it. And um, thank you again, Perry, for uh, joining us. And uh, Thank you everybody else and we hope to see you next week for our next talk. Thank you. Bye.